Welcome all to another lecture of the Rocky Mountain Map Society. I'm Angela Wood Madrid, your president, on this very special night when we're going to have a great talk. And you're going to hear more about who the speaker is and the topic. But I want to call this a, a talk about an old map from an old friend. Uh, and you'll see why, why I, I, I refer to an old map from an old friend. And so I'm going to get uh, our uh, fearless pre uh, program director, uh, Naomi Heiser, that puts together these great talks to uh, introduce our speaker and also tell us what is going on in the MAP Society. Thank you. Can everybody hear me in Zoom land still? A thumbs up, please. Yep, thank you. Wonderful. So our next meeting um, is November 29th with Stephen Nadler, and he's here, can you, right there in the audience. Um, he's gonna be speaking on maps on stamps and other ephemera. Then we'll have a holiday break and reconvene January 24th. And we're gonna have Matthew Mingus, who's a historian from University of New Mexico, Gallup. And he's gonna speak on mapping a defeated Germany in the aftermath of World War II. So tonight we have a very special talk by one of our longstanding members, Dr. Stephen Hoffenberg. He's an emergency physician retired from practice in Denver and a long-term map collector and member of the Rocky Mountain Map Society. Steve has brought some of his really, really wonderful maps. They're all on the tables in the back, which you can look at when we're done. Um, his long-term um, interests include North American cartography, the French and Indian Wars, the fur trade, and in particular, US Western government exploration documents and maps. His presentations have included the cartography of the Indian country for the Texas Map Society, as well as the Trans Appalachian West of Lewis Evans for Rocky Mountain Map Society and the Texas Map Society. And he's going to share his most recent research on the 1850 topographical engineer's map of the Trans Mississippi West, which is right here in front of us. So welcome, Steve. Well, thank you for that uh, nice introduction, Naomi. And I'd like to uh, thank Angel for putting this together, Naomi for helping me gather materials and set this up. And uh, we can blame Wes Brown for encouraging me uh, to do this talk. So I think Naomi outlined things pretty well. I'm a real fan of, uh, of uh, US uh, government documents and documents with maps, and particularly as they relate to the opening of the West. And the map that we're gonna be talking about tonight is uh, uh, the 1850 map of the topographical engineers. Now, the topographical engineers existed for about 20 years uh, as a core of the U.S. Army, but from about 1840 until they were rolled into the Army Corps of Engineers, uh, Carl Wheat said they produced the finest maps of the West, and I believe that uh, is absolutely correct. Now, this map uh, we're looking at here, we've got a copy, you can see it's a very large map, was requested by the U.S. Senate in 1848, it was compiled by the topographical engineers using all of the best data available as of that date. And it's a very uncommon map. And I have to tell you, I tracked down the commercial sale of this map. There's been two sales in the last 35 years that were recorded. It's a map that for the most part lives in libraries and larger collections. Uh, and uh, there was a sale in 1987 by Graham Rader and then Dorothy Sloan uh, sold this copy in uh, 2010. It was published separately. It was not included in a book or a report. Uh, and uh, most importantly to me, I look at maps as the reflection of history, the visual representation of history. And there was so much going on when this map was published. Uh, if you look at it, the Oregon border had been settled uh, with the British. Uh, Texas had been annexed in 1845. Uh, we had fought a war with Mexico, and there were large land sessions, specifically out to California. There were emigrations going on uh, into Oregon for land, and then with the discovery of gold in California, there was a tremendous amount of emigration into California. Uh, there was intense exploration going on uh, at that period when the map was uh, authorized. Uh, and we'll go into that exploration in detail. Uh, but also this map, interestingly, was the first map to show the boundaries of the Compromise of 1850. Now, this map itself was published between two iconic Western maps, and it's a map that I will say is known 
but not well known. And it was overshadowed uh, by the 1848 Proust map and uh, the 1857 Warren map, which was a compilation of the railroad survey maps. Um, Carl Wheat felt this was a, a beautiful map. It was an enlightened beginning to the decade of the 1850s and was the synthesis of the many varied cardiographic activities in the US uh, carried out by the army. Um, at the same time, Warren, when he published his 1857 map, uh, it was accompanied by a memoir. And if you haven't looked at the memoir, you really should. It's a roadmap to Western cartography, and it really includes pretty much every important exploration of the West. And he shrugged it off a little bit by saying that it included maps that he had already discussed. So it was, you know, a, a little uh, less than positive. Um, it's a map of national identity. And by that, I mean, people wanted to know what the country looked like. The Senate wanted to know what the country looked like, particularly with the annexation of Texas and um, the acquisition of Alta California. It was the first full map of the Trans-Mississippi West and it remained that way for seven years until Warren and Emory's maps. And it was the full expression of manifest destiny. Uh, it faithfully added virtually every government Western exploration to 1850. And as I mentioned, it reflected the compromise of 1850. So tonight, what I'd like to cover is the origins of the map. I'd like to talk a little bit about the topographical engineers, who they were and what characterized their maps. Uh, I'd like to talk about the unique content of this map and put it into the historical context of the compromise of 1850. Now, in 1848, uh, right after the end of the Mexican-American War, Congress wanted to know what the country looked like. And on the basis of a motion by Senator Jefferson Davis, and it's that Jefferson Davis who became Secretary of War and then President of the Confederacy, um, uh, they requested a map showing the operations of the Army in the United States in Texas and the adjacent Mexican territory on the Rio Grande. So they asked for a, a less broad map, but that wasn't what they were going to get. Uh, Senator Davis and uh, Colonel Hebert, who was the commander of the topographical engineers at the time, wanted to really show a grand map of the West, what the country looked like, what manifest destiny had brought us. They wanted to incorporate and update the lands acquired in the war, reflect the exploration and plan for the defense of the Texas border, uh, they were very interested in establishing a Southern emigrant route to California. And they really felt that this would be the most logical place to put a transcontinental railroad for a lot of reasons. Uh, they were advocates of the South, but in addition, there was no winter obstruction to a Southern railroad route. And they wanted to show the US in one connected view. Two years later, uh, there was no map. And the Senate became impatient. There's very interesting back and forth about this, but there were at least seven significant explorations in Texas. Uh, Marcy, uh, Captain Marcy had gone out west on an alternate route on the Santa Fe Trail, and we'll show you all these maps. Uh, and Simpson had done a report on the, on the um, uh, Navajo country. And they asked legitimately, where's our map? Davis uh, argued for uh, delaying reports being published, those seven reports plus Marcy's report until the grand map could be assembled. And to be honest with you, it was one of those things where, you know, they never knew when they were gonna pull the trigger. Information was coming in so quickly, they kept updating the map and they were delaying its publication. But after a lot of back and forth, the agreement was we'll publish all these separate reports that are completed uh, with two maps and we'll move the general map forward. So that all occurred in one session. And um, uh, the map was ultimately submitted in 1850. It was an eight foot by eight foot manuscript. Uh, I don't know where it is now. Uh, and it was reduced uh, for publication. And we have the uh, map that we see here. And again, without an accompanying report and not included in any book. So let's switch gears a little bit. Who were the topographical engineers? Uh, military uh, has had geographers associated with it since the Revolutionary War, 
But the first time the term topographical engineer was used was during the War of 1812 and Congress uh, established that designation. But these engineers were actually assigned to officers in the field, generals in command. And as an example, Stephen Long, uh, who was a lifelong topographical engineer, was assigned to Andrew Jackson's Army of the South. Um, the uh, topographical engineers were dissolved after the War of 1812, but it didn't last because there was tremendous pressure for internal improvements and civil engineering projects. And that included coastal surveys, roads, canal, canals, river improvements. And at the time, uh, there wasn't a school of engineering in the United States. And um, the source of topographical engineers as well as civil engineers was West Point. So these topographers were West Point graduates. Um, uh, most of the other engineers came from France and uh, Germany, uh, but it turned out that it was a career limiting step to become a topographical engineer. There wasn't a big future. And there was an ongoing drain of West Point graduates to more lucrative uh, civilian jobs. Now in 1831, they did organize a Bureau of Topographical Engineers under uh, Colonel John Hebert. And in 1838, they approved it as a formal corps. Uh, the Congress set the size and composition of the topographical engineers, and it was limited to 36 officers. They came and went, but there was never more than 36. And the thought was, we'll assign civil projects to the topographical engineers, and we'll give military projects to the Army Corps of Engineers. Um, now, it never worked out that way. Uh, there was never a bright line between these uh, two divisions. Uh, that improved prospect for promotion, uh, improved West Point graduate retention. It decreased the use of contracted civil engineers. But most importantly, it gave the Corps the opportunity to set its own priorities. And uh, these West Point graduates, by the way, were soldier scientists. They were trained in the military arts. They fought and they died. Uh, but they were also trained in science, mathematics, astronomy, and the arts. And if there was one theme that ran through the core of topographical engineers, it was that Western expansion and exploration was key to the future of the country and that the core was a uh, central instrument of manifest destiny. There was complete agreement. Now, the Corps remained independent for two decades uh, up to the Civil War, at which time it was merged into the uh, Army Corps of Engineers. Stephen Long uh, had risen to command, and he became second in command for the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, Getzman, and if anyone's familiar with uh, Army explorations in the West by Getzman, uh, it, it's, it's the Bible of Western Army explorations, uh, stated that they, the Corps of Engineers were largely ignored, um, and they were in the shadows of uh, those larger-than-life heroes, the mountain men, but no other group of comparable size contributed so much to the exploration development of the American West, and I, of course, agree with that. Now, before we get into the maps, let's talk a little bit about what characterized a topographical engineer map. Uh, first of all, they were highly detailed and based in science with the most modern survey techniques and the heavy use of astronomical observation. Um, they were devoid of speculative data. So when you look at these maps, uh, you see lots of blank areas on the maps where they didn't explore those areas and they were unabashed in, in that. Uh, but the most important thing to me and the most interesting thing to me were the reports that accompanied the maps. These were detailed. They had daily logs, geologic data, flora and fauna. Uh, they studied the Indian tribes and archaeologic details in the areas they were in. So they gave a much larger context than you would ever get from a map uh, alone. Now, this is a map, uh, it's a little personal, that... I really got turned on to at the first Rocky Mountain uh, Map Society Map Fair. And I, I took a look at this map and it's a simple map. And it was Simpson's map of an expedition into the Navajo country. It was a punitive expedition. Uh, it was led by Lieutenant Colonel Washington. And as I looked at the map, what caught my eye 
was it was an area of interest. It was the Rio Grande Valley and west of that. Uh, but they went through uh, Chaco Canyon, which is right here. They went through Canyon de Chez, down to the Zuni villages to Inscription Rock and on back home. And I just found that uh, fascinating. There were tables of distances. And if you look at the detail on the map, you can see that they, they outline the ruins in Chaco Canyon. Uh, what an interesting thing to do. Uh, they showed uh, Canyon de Chez, which was the stronghold of the Navajo Nation uh, at that time. But most importantly, um, that map was included in a 270 page report with six ap appendices and 64 plates. And they were just wonderful. Like, uh, for example, this table is a, a comparative language table from the different Pueblos. Uh, and of course, they had these wonderful plates from Edward uh, Kern, and they memorialized um, Inscription Rock, uh, which has subsequently been defaced in many areas. But this was an area that the Spanish and the Indians did graffiti on, uh, dating back to about 1600, by the way. And so they spent three days just looking at uh, Inscription Rock. So the 1850 map, how was it compiled? Uh, Lieutenant Gunnison had just returned from the Stansbury expedition uh, at the Great Salt Lake, and they put him in charge of completing the map. Uh, they uh, uh, actually, Gunnison wrote to his wife, today we put the office tables in place, put the books on the table, paper and pencil were made ready, and Captain Lee brought in a Fremont map to have us make additions and corrections for a general map. So they based their map and expanded and corrected their map. It was based on the 1848 Proust map. Um, and again, they produced the large manuscript map. Now, we really need to understand a little bit about the Fremont map to put the uh, 1850 map uh, into context. The, uh, eight, the 1848 Proust map, uh, was um, uh, an iconic map of the West. It was the product of three Fremont expeditions, but the Oregon Territory was contributed by uh, Wilkes Explorations. Now, we all know Wilkes as a naval commander uh, who rewrote the map of the Pacific Ocean, but he also explored the Northwest uh, uh, United States. Um, and in addition, you couldn't get to this map without contributions, topographic contributions from the Mexican-American War and specifically in the Rio Grande Valley and the Gila River. So let's talk about Fremont for just a minute. Uh, Fremont was not a West Point graduate. He apprenticed under Joseph uh, Nicolette, who was an incredible scientist. He was a French astronomer. He was a cartographer. Uh, he was uh, noted by Secretary of War Poinsett and was recruited to join the topographical engineers as a, uh, a contractor. He did a map, the hyd hydrographical basin of the upper Mississippi River, which is a cornerstone map of Western exploration. And by the way, really set the tone for subsequent topographic engineers maps. Um, um, Carl Wheat said that had he lived longer, Nicolette would have become the official government cartographer of the entire Trans-Mississippi West, but unfortunately he died of pancreatic carcinoma. And this was his map of the hydrographical basin. It was based on 90,000 astronomic and barometric measurements. And you can see that detail. And also if you look at the cartouche, uh, he does credit uh, Lieutenant Fremont as having assisted him. And again, um, he, he wasn't a West Point graduate, but uh, Wheat said, or Getzman actually said, that uh, Nicolette was his Harvard and his Yale. So he learned his craft from Nicolette. And if you look at the map, uh, the 1850 map that we have up here, you can very easily see how Nicolette's map informs uh, the 1850 map. So it was included uh, in that map. Now, Fremont's uh, did three expeditions. The first one was a short one. Uh, out the um, Platte River through South Pass into the Wind River Range. And it was, he was guided, by the way, by Kit Carson. Uh, he had the support of Senators Benton and Lynn. And the most important thing about this report 
uh, was that it stimulated tremendous public interest in exploration uh, of the West. And um, it was the only expedition where he even closely approximated the orders that Hebert supplied him. His second expedition is his most spectacular, and uh, he really uh, circumnavigated uh, the West. And many people think that after the Lewis and Clark expeditions, this was probably the most important map of the U.S. West. Now, his orders were to connect the regular Oregon Trail. And by the way, this was established by the time he got out there. In fact, he left Fort Laramie three days after Elijah White took a wagon train out of Fort Laramie. And that was um, uh, actually guided by uh, Fitzpatrick, a great uh, uh, Western fur trapper and guide. Um, but he was supposed to go out the regular Oregon Trail, connect with the surveys of Commander Wilkes, and return by the same path. Uh, and uh, this is the 1841 uh, map from Wilkes, and it's really the absolute best map of the area at the time. Uh, he did connect with uh, uh, the explorations of Wilkes and Walla Walla, but then just decided to head on down uh, the Deschutes River to the Klamath Marshes, down the western uh, uh, border of the Great Basin, uh, across the Sierras to Sutter's Fort, and then returned by way of the old Spanish Trail, and he followed it up to the Great Salt Lake and then came to the three parks in um, Colorado. So this was a grand reconnaissance. And I, I show this map of uh, Mitchell, which was published the year later, 1846, and you can see how they have fully adopted the uh, Fremont uh, topography in this map. That was about two, two plus years. Now, in 1845, uh, Fremont uh, went on his third expedition, and Hebert was clear with him. He said, look, for, look at the Arkansas, and if practicable, uh, the Red River, but stay within the boundaries of the U.S. Uh, long journeys were, are not worth it, and stay within a reasonable distance of Ben's Fort. And if you know Fremont, that wasn't what he did. He dispatched Bear and Peck uh, to um, look at the drainage of the Arkansas and the Canadian, and he headed straight west. Uh, Bear and Peck produced this wonderful map of the Great Plains, and Wes Brown did a full lecture on this map. It, it's just a fabulous map, and if you look at it and compare it to the 1850 map, you can see that it informed uh, the Great Plains and was faithfully reproduced on this map that we have here. Now, the third expedition was complicated. It wound up uh, with Fremont engaging in the Bear Flag Rebellion and, and then converting himself to um, officer of the line and ultimately getting court-martialed. But he fleshed out the interior of the Great Basin uh, with his third expedition, and it was a great map. Now, if we get back to that, that 48 map, we've got the three Fremont expeditions, we've got Wilkes explorations, but you still can't get to this map without contributions in cartography from the Mexican-American War. So what were they? Uh, and specifically, they were New Mexico by Hebert and Peck and the Gila to San Diego uh, by Emory. So let's, let's take a peek at that. The Mexican-American War, uh, that's what we called it on this side of the border, uh, south of the border, it was the Intervención Estadounidense on Mexico. It was the incursions into Mexico uh, by the United States. Uh, and in 1836, the Republic of Texas declared themselves independent. Uh, their claims were never acknowledged by the Mexican government, although hostilities did end. And the Republic of Texas was very broad in its claims. They were expansive. They were disputed. Uh, it was, uh, to, in a sense, overreach for governance. And in 1845, uh, they were annexed by the U.S. Uh, there was not agreement about what the border was. Was it the Nueces? Was it the Rio Grande? The U.S. put troops between the two rivers. Armed conflict uh, resulted, and the U.S. declared war on uh, Mexico. Now, in response to this, uh, Stephen Watts Kearney mustered the Army of the West, 
And uh, his mission was to seize New Mexico and move on to California. And I will tell you that despite years of Spanish and mountain men and Indians going back and forth in the area, there were no reliable maps of the Southwest uh, whatsoever. Um, Getzman said that the American uh, general staff was singularly ignorant of the geography and the army was provided two maps to work with as they wanted to go to California, the Tanner and the Mitchell. And these are the two maps that they were provided. And they're beautiful maps, they're wonderful maps, I love them both. Uh, but if you look at the connectivity between uh, the Rio Grande Valley, which is right here, and the Gila River, and the topography of the Gila River, there's not, there is no actionable cartography. You could not take an army west uh, based on this map. And I wanna emphasize that point. What I've got here, is the uh, 1809 Humboldt map of New Spain. Absolutely important map of the West. And if you blow it up in the area of the Gila River, this is what you see. There's no connectivity to the Rio Grande. And if you look at the Tanner map, which is the Tanner map of the United States of Mexico, 1846, it is, I would say, identical to the Humboldt map. So there was no progress in 35 years in mapping the Southwest. Now, Kearney very quickly mustered his army. He was accompanied by a fellow named Emery, uh, who was the top topographer, and he had three assistants, a statistician and a landscape painter go with him. Uh, Aber and Peck were two of the topographers. They fell ill and they uh, stayed in Santa Fe to recover and then subsequently uh, map the Rio Grande Valley. Uh, uh, Kearney uh, continued on uh, with 300 dagoons. Uh, before he left the Rio Grande Valley, he hooked up with uh, Kit Carson, who informed uh, Kearney that they had won in California. Now, that was not true, and that was premature. They were going to win, but they hadn't won yet, and um, Kearney sent back two-thirds of his troops, uh, and they, they went forward after impressing Carson in the service with the Army of the West. Uh, he was reluctant, by the way. Um, along the Gila River, Emory made 2,000 astronomical observations, 900 barometric observations. He explored pueblos, uh, looked at the animal plant life, and came up with a report that became the guidebook of the Southwest. It was so well thought of that when they went to do the railroad surveys, they felt they didn't need to explore the 32nd parallel because Emory had already done it. Now they relented on that, but that was the initial uh, plan of attack. Now, uh, Fremont was a flamboyant character, but so was Emory. And uh, he created this wonderful report and exploration. And actually, it uh, doesn't feel that way from our perspective now, but he rivaled uh, Fremont in terms of his accomplishments. Uh, shown here is uh, the map of the Rio Grande Valley done by A. Baron Peck. And it shows up here on the Fremont map. And this is the Gila River exploration. And it shows up here on the Fremont map. And it was done with the typical thoroughness of the topographical engineers. And I wanna point out one thing. Uh, they were gonna try and take wagons down the Gila, but they couldn't do that. The country was too rugged and uh, Cook, who led the Mormon battalion was the logistical support for the Army of the West. And he went south and he created Cook's Wagon Road and they joined up when it they were able. Tucson's about right here. And what's interesting was they felt right from the beginning that if you're gonna build a transcontinental railroad, you really needed to go this way on this side of the Gila River. Unfortunately, based on the treaty with Mexico at the end of the war, that was in Mexico and remained in Mexico until the Gadsden Purchase, which was uh, 1853. And if, the Gila River goes into the Great Valley? Uh, no, the Gila, hey, let me go back. Yeah, it goes into the Colorado. So uh, let's see if we can find a, a good representation of that. Um, it, it's about right here is the Colorado River. And so it, the drainage is this direction. And of course, along with the report were all of these wonderful plates and a very robust uh, written report. 
So now we've got the Fremont map of 48, and we want to expand that and really dig in a little bit into the topographical engineer map. You, you can just look at it from 10,000 feet, and what you notice is it's got uh, the entire uh, drainage of the Mississippi River. It's got the Great Plains. It has a little place called Texas, and it's got uh, Mexico, uh, the northern part of Mexico in this map. So this is broader in scope. It contains much more detail, and it's a very well executed map. So if we revisit the initial request, it was to look at the operations of the Army in the United States and Texas and the adjacent Mexican territory on the Rio Grande. So the map accomplished that, uh, but much more. Uh, Jefferson Davis advocated for exploration. Bear was concerned with protection. But the, the key to me in looking at the guts of this map is the connectivity that they wanted to create. They wanted to connect San Antonio with El Paso to get to that Cook's Wagon Road, to get an emigrant route all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And alternatively, they wanted to connect the Red River Forts, i.e. Fort Washita, uh, to uh, El Paso and then get to the Pacific Ocean. This was a stated goal. Now, this map is the 1849 Cordova map of Texas, and it's the best map of Texas at the time. And I'm going to be the first one to admit some ignorance about Texas. And I have to tell you, I had no idea how big West Texas was, how big the Trans-Pecos Texas was, and how empty it was. Now, if you were a Comanche Indian, you didn't feel that way. But if you lived in San Antonio, it was empty. There was nothing there. And if you look at what they showed on this excellent map, it's nothing. They don't know what's out there. Uh, and just to, another uh, point of interest to me when I was looking at this is that New Orleans is closer to San Antonio than El Paso is to San Antonio. It's about 550 miles. And by the way, Colorado is only 380 miles wide. So this is a vast, uh, unexplored area. And in response to the lack of knowledge in the Southwest, the Army Corps of Engineers put on a full court press to explore. Uh, they appointed uh, Joseph Johnston, uh, who was provided four top-notch topographers. They worked with the Texas Rangers and Indian agent neighbors, and they really mapped the interior of Texas, and they created three great emigrant roads uh, uh, in the Trans-Pecos West. And I'll show them to you. It's the lower emigrant road, the upper emigrant road, and then Marcy's return route from Dona Ana, which is roughly El Paso, back to Fort Washita. So what am I talking about? Well, this is the great map that was published by Johnson in that report that I had alluded to earlier, Reconnaissance in New Mexico and Texas, which was the aggregate of the seven reports plus two other reports that Bear wanted to delay publishing. And that would have been absolutely sinful. This is a cornerstone piece of uh, Western Americana. And this is the map that they, they produced. Now, I look at this map, and I've looked at it a lot, there's tremendous detail in this map, but when I first looked at it, it meant absolutely nothing to me. I could not relate this to Texas. And by the way, I have a copy of that laid out on the table back there to take a peek at uh, after the talk. So what I did was I took a, a map of Texas from the 1850 topographical engineers. I took the San Antonio de Bexar map, which is what this one in the, in the corner is, and I overlaid them. And this is what you got. You got this complex of uh, trails that were explored in both directions by multiple people looking for that connectivity between San Antonio and Fort Washita and El Paso. And so this is the great map, but I, I have a simple mind. I reduced it even more to the three great routes that were established. The one in red is the lower emigrant road from San Antonio to El Paso. Uh, the one in blue is the upper emigrant road from San Antonio to El Paso. And the gold here is actually Marcy's return route to Fort Washita. 
Uh, you could also switch from portions of the upper and lower immigrant roads at the Horsehead Crossing on the Pecos. So they, they did have some connectivity. Now this Marcy route was very interesting to me. He dropped off Simpson um, uh, in, in um, uh, Santa Fe, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And then he came back via this route. It was felt by Marcy and later by Bear to be the preferred route for a transcontinental railroad. It was flat, it was firm, there was no obstructions. And interestingly, that route crossed the head of every major river in Texas. And at the time, river commerce was looked at very favorably. And so on this route, they crossed the Pecos, they crossed the Colorado, the Brazos, the Trinity, and ultimately the Red River. So this, this was the winner uh, at the time, although that actually uh, didn't occur uh, because of um, sectional rivalries and uh, the Civil War. Now, I, I show this slide to show you what I love about the 1850 map. Here's the 1850 map. Here's the San Antonio de Bexar map, of, uh, section of it. And here is uh, in outline these uh, wagon roads and paths that were there. It is so faithfully reproduced on this 1850 map. And if you look at this map, everything on it is faithfully reproduced. It was the product of the best uh, knowledge of the uh, cartographic knowledge of the time and it is throughout the map. Now, in terms of uh, other connections I want to mention, uh, the connectivity with Mexico wasn't well understood. And there were two um, incursions into Mexico that are worth bringing up. One is General Wool's March from San Antonio to Satillo. And the other is Donovan's March, which was the longest march in the history of the U.S. Army from Fort Leavenworth through the Rio Grande Valley down the Chihuahua Trail and then over to Satillo and onto the coast. Now, Wool was accompanied by three topographical engineers. And um, for whatever reason, and Warren pointed this out, Donovan had none and he thought that was an oversight. But what do we got? Okay. Uh, okay, we did it. Um, this is an actual map of Wool's march from San Antonio to Satillo. It's well done, highly detailed. I can't make heads or tails of it looking at this map. Uh, you'd have to be from the area to have it make sense. So what I did was I overlaid this map on top of um, the 1850 map and pay attention to this area. And we see uh, a very detailed Wool's March to Satillo, which was here, Monterey was here, and Paris was over here. And it, it really contributed to an area of Mexico that north of the border, people knew absolutely nothing about. Um, Donovan's March, uh, we don't have as good a map of that because he didn't have a topographer with him. Uh, he did uh, go down the Rio Grande Valley and the Chihuahua Trail and then cut over to Satillo. And when he got to Chihuahua, he picked up a Dr. Uh, Vizsla Zenis, who was an American adventurer, had been down there uh, kicking around, amateur cartographer, and uh, he was detained by the Mexicans, uh, but Donovan freed him, and then he became, actually joined the Army Medical Corps, he was a medical doctor, uh, but uh, drew this map, which, which was published by the Senate, but was not a product of the topographical engineers. But if you add the Visla Zenis material, you start to get a pretty integrated understanding of what the Congress was interested in at the time. Now, this map uh, is one of the last two maps I'll show, um, but it, it was uh, uh, the, the march of Simpson and Marcy from Fort Smith to um, uh, Santa Fe and was by an alternate route than the Santa Fe Trail. It went along the north um, side and south side of the Canadian River. Uh, it was a detailed exploration. Simpson published four maps showing the, everything you want to know about that trail. Uh, Marcy left him in Santa Fe and then returned by that uh, southern route that we talked about along the upper immigrant trail to the Horsehead Crossing and then over to Fort Washita. Uh, and that was later reproduced and resurveyed by the topographical engineers and, and got uh, more specific. But I think this was a very important map. 
And if you look at the loop that that map created, uh, this is it here. Notice how empty the uh, area is in the middle of that. Uh, and if you add that to the Texas map, uh, you get uh, these routes coming up here. Now we've talked about this map already. This was Simpson's expedition into the Navajo country. Uh, but again, if you look at the 1850 map down here, you can see the faithful reproduction of what was shown in uh, this map. So, and you see this over and over again. It's all in here. Everything they knew in 1850 pretty much wound up on this map. Now, another interesting thing when you talk about corrections, uh, the Proust map from 1848 showed the Navajo area drained by this thing called the Red River. Now, actually, there wasn't a Red River there. And if you look at the topographical engineer map, they had now reduced this Red River, to this little nub down here. It hadn't been explored yet. Yeah, that was the little Colorado. And that would await um, the explorations of Sitgreaves and Ives, which occurred after the publication of the 1850 map. But they did show in the 1850 map the proper drainage of this area, which was the Rio uh, de um, Chaco and the Rio de Che, um, which went into the uh, here St. John's River, but it's the San Juan River here. This is a little incorrect where it met up, but uh, otherwise it was correct. So if we add that Simpson map, we get this. And then if we add Emory and Cook's Wagon Road, we get this. And if we add uh, Wool and uh, Donovan, we get this. So we now are starting to get a very integrated view of the West in, as Aber put it, one connected view. Uh, just a couple of miscellaneous things in terms of improvements. And the Fremont map, there were four noted townships in the San Joaquin and uh, Sacramento Valley. And in the 1850 map, there were 27. So you had this upgrade in, in content between these two maps. Uh, last thing, uh, in terms of corrections, big ones, the Shasta and the Klamath River, the Shasta was uh, viewed as a tributary of the Klamath. That wasn't correct. And if you look here, you see the correct drainage uh, with the um, uh, Shasta and the um, Klamath River now having separate drainages. This was another expedition by Captain Warner uh, here. So that's pretty much what that map is. And I'm really, uh, I have to tell you, it's, it's a unique piece and um, it really showed what was going on in the country at the time. Now, the political impact of the acquisition of Alta California and the annexation of Texas was a great opportunity for the US, but at the same time, it was a real threat. And in fact, what they had to struggle with was they got all this land. How are they gonna admit that land to the union? How is it going to be governed? And the thorniest issue of all, is it going to be free or is it going to be slave? And it actually uh, stimulated the, the, the expression from Henry Clay that this was a threat to the union. Uh, the debates in Congress over how the disposition of this land would be carried out in terms of boundaries and slavery uh, were the most famous in the history of Congress. And it was led by the big guys, uh, Henry Clay, Daniel Webster, John Calhoun, um, and fist fights broke out on the floor of the Senate over this. And a Senator Foote from Mississippi drew a pistol on Senator Thomas uh, Hart Benton. And so passions ran high. Ultimately, they did come up with a compromise uh, brokered by Clay and Stephen Douglas. Uh, and civil war was, uh, uh, I won't say prevented, I will say, excuse me. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, the civil war unfortunately did occur and it was over similar issues. Okay, now the Compromise of 1850 uh, started out as an omnibus bill, but they broke it down into five smaller bills so they could vote on them independently. Uh, in this compromise, California was admitted as a state, not a territory, but a state. And it kind of counterbalanced the state of Texas. It was free 
not slave. There was no history of slavery in California. Uh, Utah and New Mexico were admitted as organized territories. And the, and the Senate sidestepped uh, the issue of slavery by introducing, which was Stephen Douglas's um, uh, uh, mechanism, popular sovereignty. Let those territories decide whether they'll be free or slave. Now, they did the same thing with Kansas and Nebraska four years later, and uh, the results were not much better. Uh, new boundaries were defined for Texas. Texas ceded a large amount of land, mostly to New Mexico. Um, slavery remained legal in D.C., but further uh, trade was banned, and the Fugitive Slave Act was straightened, which stuck in the craw of a lot of northerners. Now, I want to show you this, this map of Texas. Now, this is a wonderful map. This is the Emory map, 1844, of Texas. And it shows this stovepipe configuration, which was the large, expansive configuration. Talk to me after the, uh, the presentation. I'll tell you how that came about. Um, but it extended all the way to the Rio Grande River. In fact, Santa Fe was in Texas at the time as was Steamboat and Vail and, you know, parts of Wyoming. Um, this was the first map that had the proposed Nebraska territory on it in 1844. And I wanted to shade the sessions. And when I did, I have to tell you, Texas looked pretty goofy to me. It looked kind of squished. And squished is not a term I use in the same sentence with Texas very often. And when I looked at the predecessor map, the Aerosmith from 41, which was basically lifted by Hood when he did this map, uh, and looked at the Disternel from 1847, they all had this very odd um, uh, Great Bend uh, area, and they were squished. And when I compared it to the topographical engineer map, what was obvious was that El Paso was displaced 113 miles to the east, and it was displaced 35 miles north. Now, the settlement between Mexico and America on the Mexican-American War, utilized the Disternel map as the basis for the boundary, but it was just wrong. And uh, that caused a lot of problems uh, between Mexico and uh, the United States trying to get that border settled because did you use the actual location of El Paso or as agreed upon the Disternel map, which was uh, very off. I just threw that in there. That's. Uh, now, the last thing I'm gonna mention is that the 1850 compromised borders of the states and territories appeared for the first time on this map. You can't see them easily, but if you look carefully, let's see, you can see the border of California here and the border between New Mexico and uh, Utah here. And so they were traced out on this map. And again, uh, that was uh, relatively groundbreaking. Now, the topographical engineers did not disappear after 1850, and they had really significant explorations. Uh, Sitgraves on the uh, Zuni in Colorado, um, Warren in Kansas and Nebraska, uh, the railroad surveys, uh, the border survey by Emory, Ives on the Colorado, Macomb on the Colorado Plateau. These were all to come and were all part of the topographical engineers, obviously not on this map. Uh, this is just to show you what Warren's map looked like in 1857, which was a compilation of a great number of maps uh, done by uh, five explorations uh, for a railroad route. This is Emory's map of the border survey. So in conclusion, uh, this was a map of national identity. This told the U.S. what they had in 1848 through 1850. It stood as the only map of the full Trans-Mississippi West for seven years. It reflected manifest destiny. It incorporated a bunch of new data and uh, also corrected a lot of errors with the accuracy of the topographical engineers. And it was the first map reflecting the Compromise of 1850. And it was compiled at such an intense period in American history that we've talked about. So with that, um, I'm going to actually stop talking, and uh, I would like to entertain any discussion or answer any questions that I can. Is that okay, Amhill? Yes, maybe you can repeat the question from the audience. Yes.
Okay, go ahead. Carl Wheat wrote, I'm sorry? Oh, the question is who is Carl Wheat? Um, I, I make assumptions, I apologize. Carl Wheat wrote a seven volume uh, book uh, mapping the Trans Mississippi West. It is the absolute Bible of mapping of the Trans Mississippi West. So if you haven't seen it, you really need to take a look at it. And it's, it's a tremendous reference work. Uh, so I would really take a look at that. It doesn't look like the 1850 map has a boundary between Mexico and the United States. No. Uh, it, it doesn't look like this map, the 1850 map, had a boundary. Now, it did and it didn't. Uh, it was the Gila River to the Colorado. And then I believe, let me check if I don't hang myself. There is a line going from the Colorado River to below San Diego on this map. What it doesn't have is between El Paso and the head of the uh, uh, Gila River, because that was a source of tremendous uh, discussion between Mexico and the United States based on that displacement that I talked about. And so that didn't get resolved until 1853 when the U.S. Uh, executed the Gadsden Purchase and got below the Gila River. Chris? Uh, but you don't really talk anything about any exploration in the northern part. Uh, is there no progress being made between this and the uh, Freud's map, or is it just been selected? I'm sorry, between this and the what map? Cruise map, right. Uh, first of all, uh, it, what, what Chris just asked was, we, they didn't really talk about the Northwest, and they didn't really talk about the upper Great Plains, to be honest with you. The areas uh, that are currently Montana and the drainage of the uh, Missouri River were really kind of passed over. Once the fur trade kind of subsided, there wasn't a lot of interest in that area. Now it would come again, and a fellow named Reynolds in uh, 1859 did that portion of the country. In terms of the Northwest, this is really uh, Wilkes uh, geography in the Northwest. But Carl Wheat said something interesting. He said that there were coastal improvements in this map that he cannot account for. He don't know where they came from. So this is very improved in the Northwest, at least in terms of coastal geography. Other than that, there were great areas that were not explored. And I mentioned the Colorado, the Little Colorado, the Colorado Plateau, those remain to be explored yet, and, and they really didn't touch on that. Does, is that responsive to your question, Chris? Okay, sorry. Three or four slides, we've got the subsequent accomplishment of the photographers. The list of all their names and the things that they Oh, yeah. Had. Okay. Uh, it seems to cut off at about 1860. Did the Civil War yes. impact? Yes. The, the core of topographical engineers, uh, the question is what happened after? this list of explorations to, and uh, and the Civil War did cut it off. Um, and at, at that point, these topographical engineers were rolled into the Army Corps of Engineers. Now, uh, having said that, uh, things got pretty tough in terms of putting resources into exploration when you're engaged in a Civil War. And so uh, a lot of the stuff, like for example, the Reynolds map, uh, and also a Texas border survey map were not even published until well after the, the Civil War, because even though they were in the can, uh, it wasn't a priority to publish them. Uh, the question is, did the topographical engineers interact with Native Americans? Did they encounter hostility and did they get information? The answer is yes. Uh, the Nicolette map, by the way, could not have been done without the cooperation of multiple tribes. And he had a tremendous relationship with Native Americans. And they led him to all these 10,000 little lakes and helped him outline them. And he got passed from tribe to tribe as he went further west. So. They got very valuable information. If you look at the Abar and Peck of the Great Plains, 
a lot of that was informed by Native American information. Now, did they meet hostility? Yes, they did. And uh, Lieutenant Gunnison became Captain Gunnison. He was killed uh, by uh, Utes. Uh, Warner, I kind of showed you a little bit of Warner's exploration out of the um, Sacramento Valley. He was to connect with the Humboldt River. He was killed by Native Americans. So the answer is both. They were helped and they frequently encountered hostility. And I tell you, the last place I would have wanted to be in 1849 might have been in the Trans-Pecos West uh, because the people that ruled the land were the Comanche. So it, it, there, was, there were tough times. Susan? Building on this back, I'm, I'm really curious, both what the Senate does with this map and then related to that, is there a connection between this map and the negotiations that led to the Treaty of Fort Laramie the following year? Okay, the question is, did this map uh, impact the, the Treaty of Laramie? The uh, Treaty of Laramie is a really interesting piece of history. And with the exception of the Pawnees that were excluded, uh, they, they really had pretty much all of the Western Indian tribes gather at Fort Laramie to try and lay out where those uh, tribal boundaries would be to the extent that the uh, Native Americans would recognize those boundaries uh, ultimately. And I would say no. I would say that the cartographic influence on that part of the country came from the one person that contributed in this period that wasn't a topographical engineer, and that was Father DeSmith. And he, he really uh, did the mapping of that area. So I hope that's responsive to your question. Yes. Bill wants to know, Anton Schornborn was the topographer for Reynolds in 1859-60. Did he work for the topographic force before that? I, I, I would have, I don't know. And they're asking about who the, I'm sorry. The, Anton Schornborn was the topographer for Reynolds. Did uh -huh. he work for um, So you've heard the question. I don't know the answer, to be honest with you. <laughs> And honesty is not my strength, so yeah. Do a projection in that case? No. I guess probably. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know, Susan or Chris, do you know what kind of projection this is? I don't know. Do you have a lot of expeditions that put these maps together with us? They weren't supported, but once they went out, they were kind of down and up. Um, the question is, uh, what kind of support did the topographical engineers get when they hit the field? And uh, the truth is they were quite often supported by a military contingents. For example, Simpson was the topographer on the map that I showed you. He's with Captain Marcy. Um, and they frequently were assigned, you know, um, 20 to 75 uh, mounted soldiers to go with them. So they did get support, but keep in mind they were they were military themselves and they were prepared to fight and did. In fact, Emory is um, uh, credited with uh, saving Stephen Watts Kearney's life uh, in a battle. Uh, was it Palo Alto or what was the name of the battle? San, pa San Pablo or something like that. But it was one of the great battles in California. So they really fought, but they frequently had military escorts. And by the way, a lot of them were military expeditions with a topographer along with them. So, you know, it worked both ways. You said that El Paso was out of position by 130 miles. 113, yeah. So were a lot of other points out of position than equally that much? Uh, everything is messed up. Yeah. Well, the question is, is, was the El Paso displacement typical or atypical? And I would say that in looking at the maps, and I, I did like compare the, this Lazenus map to the topographer's map, I couldn't really reconcile them because they were often off by a degree, which is a, a lot. And um, I think that things were off, but that was one of the most important and um, extreme examples that I found in looking at the map. Uh, and are we okay to keep taking questions? Really simple question. How did they keep 
the lot. How did they keep records of it? Such that when they came back, they knew the bigger man on an expedition. Was it readings or was it were they drawings? Did they have large books or maps that they would be keeping? Uh, they, they kept metic. Uh, the question is, how did they keep records um, uh, of all this cartography and other information? And the answer is, uh, they carried it with them and they brought it back to Washington. And these things are, are stored in several locations, uh, but you can go back and look at, at manuscript material. But they they had a very set pattern of not only how they drew maps, which was kind of an end product, but how they explored, how they documented their observations, both barometric for elevation, astronomical for you know position, and they kept detailed daily logs of everything that they did. And I would really encourage you to look at uh, some of these reports. Uh, some of them are like uh, eating cardboard; others are just fabulous. And so you have to pick the right one, but uh, but they're really detailed. And everything was stored in Washington. One last question. We'll do two questions. Two questions. Okay. Um, you began by talking about the comparative um, underutilization and unfamiliarity with the map. Do we have Warren to blame for that? Uh, you know, uh, why was this map overshadowed and overlooked? And, you know, I don't have the answer for that because it's so obvious to me what an important map this is. Uh, we can blame Warren, but the map also had a run of seven years without, you know, any competition uh, to speak of. And I think that, you know, first of all, they authorized 3,500 copies of the map. I have a difficult time believing that they either printed that many maps or that they weren't destroyed in bulk, which unfortunately has happened multiple times where they've been cleaning out the archives and they go, oh, here's a stack of these old maps, just put them in the dumpster. Uh, or the fact that it was separately published, not part of a book, not part of a governmental report, that it, it really didn't get widespread dissemination. And so I, I really can't account for it. Um, uh, I, I would like to blame Warren, but I think it's more complicated than that. Uh, Warren was a competitor of this map, you know. Last question. Yeah. Okay, briefly, the, the stovepipe configuration of Texas was the full expression of Texas expansionism. And what they said was that we, we own everything east of the, the Rio Grande River and from the headwaters of the Rio Grande River to the 42nd parallel, which is the border of the United States. And they said, we own everything from the headwaters of the Arkansas River to the 42nd parallel, which was the border of the United States. And if you map that out, you get that stovepipe configuration. And that's why it extends into Colorado and Southern Wyoming and, and New Mexico. And it's, it seems to me just outrageous that they would claim Santa Fe as being part of Mexico, but that's just me. My wife's an old Santa Fe family person. So. Chris, last question. Some of that came from the reason they went up to the 32nd parallel is that from the original uh, border between Mexico and the United States. So they were making the claim even to be Mexico, not even to be the United States. So right. From Mexico, this is the territory we are claiming. And that's why it went all the way up. And I agree. I agree with that completely. I think that is the explanation. One final question from online. But okay. Did Captain Stansbury's 1850 route east from Fort Bridger through Bridger's Pass displayed on this map? Um, That's from Bridger's Blessing. Okay. Uh, was Stansbury's route displayed in, uh, on this map? And the answer is some of Stansbury's information made it to this map, but most of it had to do with Great Salt Lake. And Stansbury's expedition wasn't published until after this map was published, and the roots are not shown on this map. Thank you so much.
Oh, thanks, everybody. Also online, uh, let me um, get rid of this. Uh, thank you for patiently being there. Stop sharing. And we're going to have this presentation um, uh, uploaded to our website pretty soon, so you can enjoy it again. Uh, there was one comment on, on online that says, a masterful presentation, Dr. Hoffinger. So thank you so much. And thank you, History Colorado. And we'll see you here in uh, next month, I think, for the next presentation. Thank you all online. Thank you all in person. And we'll see you next time.